Good afternoon and welcome back to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens. It's our webinar series where we help hope to help you turn your brown thumb a bit greener. And we will do that today for sure with all this review on Back to Basics with Sarah Dickert, one of our horticulturists at Smithsonian Gardens. I'll let Sarah introduce herself to you in just a minute, but let me tell you a bit about what we're going to do today. So as always, please put your questions in the chat box and we will do our very best to answer them. We, it has a full packed day, so or full packed hour I should say, so if we don't get to all your questions, please send them to us in our gardens mailbox, which is gardens, sigardens at si.edu. And we'll be glad to answer them for you. Also, if you're interested in finding out more about the different webinars that we offer this year, we're doing them month by month. So on our website right now, we have January sessions. Then we'll switch over to February here very soon. We'll be adding them on. But we will try to go through the season all the way into June before we take a break again. We are so excited to have you join us and we're so interested in sharing the gardens with you. Please know the gardens are open and are ready for you to visit if you're in the area. If not, we have plenty of beautiful tours and images on our website. So without further ado, Sarah Dickert, Dickert please tell us what we should be doing to make our brown thumbs a bit greener and to make our gardens look as beautiful as the Smithsonian Gardens do. And I know you'll have lots of good information for us. I'm going to disappear, but I'll be here to help. Don't worry. And then I'll join you at the end of your presentation and we'll be able to share the questions that our audience has with you. So mm -hmm. thanks for today and thanks for helping us out. See you in a bit. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Cindy. Um, as Cindy mentioned, my name is Sarah Dickard, and I am a horticulturist for Smithsonian Gardens, and I care for the gardens that are around the National Air and Space Museum uh, on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., if you're not familiar with where we're located. Um, when I was, we were sort of talking about presentations to kind of kick off our, our Let's Talk Gardens program for the year, uh, I really kind of thought, what a good idea to start off a new year and start off our new uh, session of programs with sort of getting back to basics and covering um, just terms and things and ways to to get yourself going with gardening this year especially if you're new to gardening maybe it's something that you're interested in picking up and even if you're you know if you consider yourself an old hat at gardening hopefully there'll be some things to sort of refresh your memory on uh, and maybe pick up a few new terms a few new techniques things like that my slides going here. So just kind of wanted to start off. Um, I think the best way to really approach gardening is, is know where you're gardening, know about your garden and, and learn about um, what you're going to be working with and getting acquainted with that. Um, then talking a little bit about plants uh, and how to plant, um, some tools that I recommend using, and then a few resources and a time for questions at the end. <clears throat> so getting into it here with uh, learning about your garden. I mean, that's really the first place that you want to start is know what you're working with um, and know what the conditions are because that's how you're going to be most successful um, with having a beautiful garden and having that success. And one of the first places that you really want to start with is knowing what your hardiness zone is. Um, some of you may be pretty familiar with this and some of you, this may be completely new information. Um, hardiness zone is defined as being a geographic area that has a certain range of minimum um, cold temperatures. So basically it's breaking up different parts of the United States or North America really um, into regions based on like their average lowest temperatures, usually in, in the winter months, that sort of thing. And that's really what's going to, going to define if your plant is going to live and survive the winter months and come back um, year after year and, and grow in your garden. 
Um, so this is something that was originally developed in the 20s and 30s by the Arnold, Arnold Arboretum in Boston, Massachusetts. And it went through a bunch of iterations, a bunch of different people kind of working on um, map and, and um, kind of categorizing the regions of, of the United States like this. Um, but finally, it landed on um, being managed by the, uh, the US Department of Agriculture. So they're the ones at this point that are managing this. They're the ones that are sort of determining these plant hardiness zones. So you can find these maps maps and all the information pretty easily on their website. So to find your zone, I'm going to use um, Smithsonian Gardens as an example. Uh, we are located, like I said, in Washington, DC. So if you zoom in on a plant hardiness map, um, you will see that we are in a light green area, medium green. I don't know how you want to describe that. And if you look at the key on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see that Washington DC falls in sort of a, a zone seven um, range, a zone seven A. And that means that plants that have been determined to be hardy to zone seven means that they're going to um, live and they're going to be happy growing in um, this region of the United States. Um, something just to keep in mind once you've kind of figured out your broad zone is that even if you are in a certain zone, you might um, fall under sort of um, microclimates. So since we are a city, uh, that kind of puts us into being an urban heat island. So we're able to get away sometimes with uh, planting things that maybe would like being a little bit warmer because we have some of those uh, heating effects that we that you get by being in a city, even though we're technically a zone seven. Um, other things to keep in mind is you might have things like microclimates. So for example, we're in DC, which is already a little bit warmer than maybe the rest of zone seven, just by a little bit. Um, but we're also looking here at our Enid A. Hop Garden, which is located behind the Smithsonian Castle. And this garden is actually um, entirely basically a rooftop garden. Even though you walk in at street level and it's basically looks like a street level garden, um, it's actually a garden planted over the galleries for the Asian Art Museum and the African Art Museum, which means that that garden in particular is actually even a little bit warmer than the rest of the gardens that we have on the mall. And so we're able to do things like plant palm trees because that um, soil is kept a little bit warmer through the winter months. And so we're able to sort of push our limits. Um, so for you and your home gardens, that might mean that you have the south facing wall or side of your house that maybe is able to stay a little bit warmer or maybe you're also located in a city. Maybe you're located in the valley um, between a mountain range or something like that. We're actually a little bit colder than what your zone is. And this takes a little bit to sometimes figure out exactly you know, where you can push the boundaries of being too kind of too hot or too cold. Um, but knowing where to start and what your general region's zone is, is kind of the first step to determining what plants are going to be most successful. All right, so the next thing you want to figure out for your garden is your sun and your shade. So a lot of times um, on plant labels, when you're shopping in nurseries or as you're doing research for plants that you want to have, it will indicate if that plant wants full sun, part sun, full shade, things like that. And you need to be able to determine what your garden is. Um, full sun is usually uh, designated as, as a spot that has six or more hours of just full blazing direct sunlight through the course of the day. Um, and then kind of conversely, you have things like full shade, or it's getting usually four hours of less or less of direct sunlight um, and particularly not afternoon sunlight when the sun is the hottest and the most intense. Um, keep in mind as you are maybe thinking and planning and working on your, your garden dreams for the year ahead um, that the sun has a different path in the sky right now and, and the sunlight is coming in at kind of a different angle than it will during the summer months. Um, so areas that maybe are sunny or shady right now might be slightly different by the time the summer months roll around. And keep in mind that trees don't have leaves on them. Um, so spots that you might think are full sun or at least part sun, by the time they're leafed out in the summer, that might be a shady spot in your garden that you weren't anticipating. So it takes a little bit. It takes kind of watching your garden for a year or two to kind of figure out where the sun um, hits, where you get shade from your house, where you get shade from your tree, from a neighbor's tree, neighbor's buildings, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but then I just kind of have listed here sort of a, a rough breakdown of, of what that means as far as 
um, giving your plants the sunlight that they want and that they need. So once you've figured out, you know, you've got your hardiness zone, you know what plants are going to like living in that, that region where you live, um, you figured out whether or not they're going to like the full sun or the full shade that you might have, you also want to consider the soil types that you have. Um, your soil is really the foundation of, of growing healthy, successful plants. Um, this is something that you can, can really make or break the success of a plant that you have in your garden. And so understanding the soil type that you have is, is a pretty important place to start. Um, there's pretty much three different kinds, uh, or soil I should say is comprised of uh, three different materials, either sand, silt, or clay. And then from there, you can kind of see on this chart how there's various com co uh, combinations of how much percentage you have of any of those um, different sort of ingredients that will make up different soil types. Um, so probably your biggest question from there is like, how do I know what kind of soil I have? Um, because it may or may not be obvious to you because some of those, I mean, what's the difference between a sandy clay and a clay loam? I mean, that, you know, who knows? <laughs> who knows how to tell that just by looking, right? Um, so one thing you can do is do like a little at home test. Um, there's kind of much better examples of this um, if you do like a search online uh, that kind of walk you through the steps a little more in detail. Um, but essentially you can fill a jar with some soil, fill the rest away with some water and a little bit of just so dish soap, uh, shake it up and start to let the, the different pieces settle out in your so of the soil. So at the bottom, bottom of the jar here, hopefully you can see my mouse, um, you'll see this is where the sand is starting to settle out. This middle layer is where the silt is starting to settle out and then the clay particles are gonna to start to settle out above that. Um, from there, essentially you just measure like kind of the total um, amount that you have of soil that's in the jar, um, measure how much each one makes up of that total um, amount and then get the percentage. So just sort of in this hypothetical situation on this slide, I just sort of, went with the assumption that there's maybe 60% sand, just going, you know, eyeballing it. Um, and then I decided that there was maybe 30% silt. And then after that, about 10% clay. And these are just me totally guessing and just for examples. Um, and then where they cross, uh, it gives you a sandy loam. So in this hypothetical situation, the soil that's in that jar is a sandy loam soil. Um, you can also certainly send your soil away to be tested in a lab. And this is something that's uh, pretty easy to do um, by searching online or contacting your extension agency, which I will kind of talk a little bit about at the end. Um, and they can kind of tell you definitively if you don't want to do like a jar test. Um, something else that they can tell you and something else that you'll want to know is what is the pH of your soil and sort of where does your soil stand with its nutrient levels? So soil pH, um, part of why that is so important is because it helps to make nutrients that plants need more or less available, depending on how acidic or how basic your soil is. So you might be familiar with a chart like this that you might've seen in a biology class or a science class, something like that. Um, depending, soil that's really, really acidic is uh, a lower number like the zero through four. And then as you get into really basic uh, things, that's getting up into your 12s, 13s, and 14s. Plants really like soil that is on average around a 6.5 on the pH scale. That is when um, the primary nutrients that it likes are the most available to them. And that's a whole discussion on soil chemistry that I don't have time to talk about today, but um, Basically, having your soil at that pH is, is where these nutrients that plants need most available to them. It's easiest for them to collect them out of the soil and use those nutrients to grow and flower and, and you know, do all the processes that they need to do. Um, probably most of you are familiar or at least have heard of the term photosynthesis. That's what plants do to get energy to grow. Um, so the three things that they need the most are carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, not unlike us ourselves as humans. Um, and then after that, they, the, the next kind of top three uh, nutrients that it needs are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So if you've ever gone shopping for a fertilizer in a garden center or something like that, you've probably seen on fertilizer bags or bottles, 
uh, three numbers that are listed, maybe like a 12, 12, 12, or a 603 or something like that. Those three numbers indicate the amount of those three nutrients that are in that particular blend of fertilizer. Um, the first number is the nitrogen, the middle number, um, the P is the, the phosphorus, and the last number, which is indicated by a K, is potassium. Um, and so those are kind of the next big three things that plants like for um, performing some of their major biological processes. And so that's why those are used in various formulations of fertilizers um, to, to help your plants. Again, you can send in probably the best way to test a lot of this is to send your soil in for a soil test. And um, they'll be able to tell you kind of where your soil stands, not only in its pH, um, if there's deficiencies of any of these different types of nutrients, and usually they'll make suggestions on um, what you might need to add or, you know, do to kind of amend your soil to sort of get it where it should be. All right. Another thing to just sort of keep in mind, um, in addition to um, just the type of soil you have and where the pH and the nutrients are, is also, you know, sort of how wet or dry your soil is more or less on average throughout the course of the year. There's always gonna be fluctuations on times when it's really dry or really wet, but sort of knowing the consistent amount of um, moisture that's in your soil is also gonna be helpful in helping you to decide uh, what plants that you're gonna wanna um, be able to grow successfully in your garden. You know, you think about, um, if perhaps some of you are watching from you know, the West Coast or, um, somewhere where, you know, we have our more arid and desert climates in the United States, you know, those are really dry soils. So those are the places where you're growing um, the different kinds of cactuses and succulents and, and things that, that thrive and are able to be well adapted to, to dry soils. Um, maybe perhaps compared to, um, you know, the swamps of, of Florida and the plants that, that like to grow in the Everglades, you know, those plants grow in almost complete water and that's what they love and that's what they thrive on. So knowing what your different um, soil types are, or sorry, like the moisture in your soil is, is going to help you to decide what plants are going to be best suited um, for those different types of soil conditions. Um, even here on the East Coast, you know, we, you might have like a low-lying area in your yard. And maybe it stays wet all the time just because it doesn't drain really well, or maybe it gets um, sort of flooded when there's rain. Uh, maybe you're looking at different types of plants that grow best along, um, you know, creeks and rivers and that sort of thing, so that they're they're going to be adapted to those types of soils um, that you have in in your in your garden. All right. So now we sort of talked a little bit about getting yourself acquainted with your garden, the conditions that you have, and you're like, okay, I'm ready to get plants, but that is a confusing name on that label. Um, I don't disagree. I feel like plant names can be very confusing. Half the time they're unpronounceable. Um, I get it. <laughs> um, why do we do that? Just to uh, torment ourselves? No, I promise that's not it. Um, <laughs> so in the 1700s, this uh, handsome gentleman that we see on the screen here is Carl Linnaeus. He decided he was a Swedish botanist and he decided that we needed a way of organizing and standardizing the way that we um, identify plants so that everyone, no matter where you are in the world, um, is able to talk about plants essentially in a common language or in a common way that we all know what each other is talking about. Um, and so he is actually the one that came up with this method of essentially organizing and, and defining plants based on certain characteristics. And it's now the method that's used, I think, really for all living things. Um, that's taking me back to my own biology classes, trying to remember. <laughs> um, haven't looked at this in a long time, I'll be honest. Uh, but he is really the one that kind of came up with this, this classification system, starting up in the huge broad category of you know, domain and working our way down to genus and species, which is what we use um, in horticulture uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as a way to identify plants and as a way to make sure that we're all talking about the same plants, specifically because different places in the world, people use different, um, what we call kind of colloquial or common names to identify plants. And what I might call bluebell here, maybe on the East Coast is not what someone even on the West Coast, or maybe someone in Europe or someone, you know, somewhere else, they might call 
bluebells, a different plant altogether. But if we're all talking about the plant that goes by the genus name of muscari, then we all know that we're talking about the same thing. Um, so that's kind of how we get to identifying plants by genus and species. It doesn't help with pronouncing it, I'll admit, but that's just kind of where it's at. Um, from there, after genus and species, essentially, if we had like another little triangle there beneath species, we get into um, varieties and cultivars. Um, I feel like in the horticulture industry, if you talk to other professionals, we sort of use the terms variety and cultivar interchangeably. Um, however, they are different things. Uh, basically, a variety is happens when um, two species of the same plant uh, cross in just in nature, in that like very um, in nature naturally on their own, and result in a plant that has a unique or different characteristic um, that we find desirable in whatever way. Um, a cultivar is a plant that has. Um, a cross has also been made either by plant, two plants of the same species um, or two plants of different species, um, whatever the case may be, but it's done either on purpose or in a garden setting, even if it's kind of by accident. Um, and it still resulted, again, either on purpose or by accident in a plant with um, characteristics that we find desirable. So that's how you have roses and that are a million different colors and some of them smell really good and some of them don't smell really good or some of them are gigantic big shrub roses that are climbing and some of them are you know teeny tiny little things um, so that's kind of how we get those different plants um, and then of course we have the common names like i said which are you know completely variable and change by region. Um, so you'll see if you come visit Smithsonian Gardens that we have these uh, tags in our gardens identifying at least most or as many as we can <laughs> of the plants that we have. Um, you can see at the top here, the first thing we have is the, the genus listed, and then we'll have the species listed. If it's not a hybrid, if it's not something that's crossed with another species, and then we'll have the cultivar name, again, if there is one, unless it's a straight species plant, and then the common name. So this actually, this plant's actually a great example of how common names can differ, even among plants of the same genus or plants of the same species. Um, some of you may be familiar with the plant heuchera as being called coral bells. So this is a heuchera. So this is also could be called coral bells. Um, however, another name for this uh, particular species of heuchera is also the hairy alum root. So even this plant right here, it kind of shows right off the bat how common names are variable, but if we all say heuchera or we all say heuchera autumn bride, you, you know, we'll, everyone will know what's being talked about. We'll all know. And so that's kind of the reason for these, what may seem complicated or confusing names. That's why we use them and that's why they're important to use. All right. Next slide here. So just wanted to go over a little bit, um, just sort of different ways that we categorize plants because that will just, as you're researching or as you're talking to other professionals, um, you know, what do these terms mean or what do we mean when we say them? Um, I think even to some extent, they might be a little confusing um, or just easy to get confused perhaps. Uh, starting off with um, herbaceous and woody, so woody is maybe kind of self-explanatory. Uh, that's something that's gonna have, you know, kind of thick or not even thick, but stiff branches or trunks or stems. Usually they have some sort of like a bark on the outside, um, maybe not super easy to break, that sort of thing. Herbaceous plants are usually much more sort of tender and soft and succulent. And if you, you know, you break them and they kind of feel really watery, um, that's an herbaceous plant. From there, we get into differentiating between annuals and perennials. So I think those two words are the most confusing, especially if you're just getting started with gardening to remember which one is which in particular. I know I was, took me a little bit while to like remember which one was which um, back when I was starting to kind of get into gardening. Um, annuals are something that only lasts for one growing season. So for us, that's usually things like the summer annuals, which you'll see in this like top picture. These are plants that will grow and they'll be blooming and they'll be beautiful um, all during the summer months. And then once it gets cold, those plants are going to die and they will not come back the following year. Conversely, perennials. 
show this picture. So this bed here is made up mostly of perennials. And those are plants that though the tops of the plant may die back over the, over the winter months, the roots will stay alive and they will um, continue to just kind of lay dormant in the soil. And then next summer, they'll come back up and they'll be lush and they'll be green and they'll be back. Same as where I had planted them or where they had been the year before. So this bed here, pretty much kind of the outer ring around those red foliage plants is all perennials. And then this um, red foliage plant here is coleus and that's an annual. So that's something that I have to replace every year should I want to do that um, or replace with something. And then everything else around it is perennials. Right now, they're admittedly not much to look at. Um, they're just some stalks, but next year they'll be back and they'll be looking the same as they were, you know, mostly the same as how they look in this picture from this past summer. Um, from there, we get into differentiating between um, like evergreen and deciduous. So evergreen, again, kind of as the name set indicates something that stays green all year long. Um, so we have things like this uh, weeping Alaskan cedar that's planted in front of the Smithsonian castle. And then we also have things that like this cherry laurel and this inkberry holly, which are broadleaf evergreens. So not all evergreens have needle-like leaves. Um, sometimes they have broad kind of regular, I'm gonna use that in quotes, regular looking leaves, but they stay on the plant all year long and they are green all year long. Uh, one term I don't have on here that I will just wanna point out is the word conifer. So conifer is used to, de to uh, denote any type of plant that um, has sort of needle-like foliage. So this tree that's here behind the weeping cherries that currently doesn't have any, at least in this picture, doesn't have anything on it is actually a dawn redwood. So that tree is a conifer. It has needle-like leaves. However, it is actually deciduous. So it loses its, its needles in the winter, the same as you would expect oak trees like this one in this picture or Japanese maples like this one. So uh, not all conifers are evergreens, just, kind of an interesting distinction to make. Um, and then obviously deciduous are plants that maybe you're most familiar with, trees that do lose their leaves during the winter months, and then they push out new leaves in the spring when it's warm um, and they're nice and full and green again. Okay. So this is talking a little bit, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, what's on plant labels kind of specifically, and that's getting into talking about plants their mature height and their mature width or spacing. Um, as you're planning your garden and trying to think about where you wanna place things, you wanna take into consideration how big it gets. So most of the time on plant labels or on websites as you're researching, um, you will see indicated um, somewhere, hopefully, how tall the plant gets and also how wide it gets. So spacing or space, as most of these tags say, is also an indication of basically how wide the plant gets. Um, and it's used sort of synonymously with how far apart you should space the plants as you're planting them. So just to sort of break that down a little bit better, um, kind of, I use this tag as like an example, this uh, Asclepius, this butterfly flower, but butterfly weed. Um, it says that the spacing for this plant is 12 inches wide. So you know that this plant, when it's growing and when it's, um, mature will be 12 inches wide, but if you have two of them or more, you want to also space them 12 inches apart. And that's 12 inches from the middle of the plant, not from the edge of the plant or the edge of the pot um, that you're, when you know, when you go to plant them. Um, that way, you know that as these plants grow and they mature, they're actually going to grow together and it will look almost like one big plant and you're going to have a nice full garden um, by properly spacing your plants. Um, and certainly height is always a consideration. Um, I think all of us have seen plant, uh, trees that have been planted under power lines. Maybe consideration was at the time not taken in uh, for how tall that tree was gonna get and the fact that it was gonna grow up into the power lines and that it's gonna need to be pruned to keep it off the power lines. Um, so that's also something you wanna consider as far as not only how wide the plant gets and you know, is it gonna to be too close or too far away from, from other buildings or other plants, but also how tall is it gonna get? All right, keep going here. Oops, sorry, skipping ahead, too far. Um, 
Okay, ready, you picked out your plants, you have them laid out, how to plant. This is um, unfortunately done incorrectly more often um, than not. And so I wanted to include this in my presentation to just go over this process. Um, and it is um, embarrassingly and sometimes even done by other professional landscapers. Um, so you don't have to be one of those people. You can do it right. You can be the person that's planting your plants correctly because even if you've done all the research to figure out what your growing environment is for your garden and you've set it up and you've gotten it ready and you're like, this is the perfect plant. It's gonna be in the perfect spot. It's gonna like growing here. If you don't set it, if you don't plant it correctly, you're, you know, setting it up for issues or setting it up either right away or later down the line. Um, so this example, you kind of have to bear with me a little bit. I did using one of my house plants uh, and just sort of for sample purposes, planting it into another container, but the process is the same. It doesn't matter where you're planting it, whether it's in a garden, when it, whether it's in another pot, it doesn't matter. The process ex is exactly the same. Um, so the first thing you're gonna do is um, obviously remove the pot from the plant. And you're also probably gonna to want to break up the roots. For the most part, plants that are growing in pots um, will often become what's called like pot bound or root bound. Um, that's when the roots are, you know, it's growing and they hit the walls of the pot and they start to circle. Um, and what can happen is that even if you have dug a, a you know, really nice hole and you've planted the pot and you're watering it and you're taking care of it, sometimes a plant just doesn't know that it can stop going in a circle and that it can start growing outwards into the soil. And so you can break the roots apart. It's okay. It might feel like you're doing the wrong thing, but I can assure you you're doing the right thing by doing that. Um, you know, pull those roots apart, break them apart, loosen them up so that once they're in the hole, they can be like, hey, I can go where I want now. All right. And then, okay. So then um, you also want to just make sure that this, the hole that you're digging is the right size. Um, you don't, do not, the biggest issue that I see with planting is planting things too deeply. And that is both um, with trees, with perennials, with annuals. Um, you know, look at where the top of the soil is on the root ball of the plant. And you want that line to be exactly even with the soil that you're planting it into. Okay, you don't want the root ball of the plant, like when you go to put the soil back, that it covers it up. Um, you want them to be right at the same height height. And then you also want to try to dig the hole about twice as wide as the, um, as the root ball itself. So you have room to kind of work soil back in around the plant um, uh, as you're getting it situated. Um, from there, you'll obviously sort of backfill the soil that you have. Um, you don't want to add any amendments at this point. You don't want to add um, other types of soil or compost. You really want this plant to be adapted to the soil that you have and to know that that is the soil it's growing in um, by adding other types of soil or other types of um, amendments like compost. Um, it can kind of trick the plant into thinking that that's the only place where it can go and it won't be well adapted to the soil that is in your garden. Um, again, firming in the soil around the root ball as you um, fill the, the hole back in again, that just helps to stabilize the root ball so that, you know, if it's windy or whatever, you know, it's going to kind of lock that plant into place until the roots can get growing. And then um, in addition to that, uh, not burying um, the crown of the plant, which is kind of the primary growing point. So in this picture, I'm kind of pointing, you know, the top of the plant here is the crown. Um, or when we're talking about trees in particular, not burying the root flare. So the root flare, this is, you know, certainly just a little kind of pictogram. Um, but a root flare is right where the trunk meets, um, where the roots start to grow out, the primary roots. And it is a habit for people to, you know, you're filling the soil, like the soil back into the hole and they kind of like bring the soil like right up to the trunk. You don't want to do that. There's a, a ton of issues that you'll have later down the line. Um, if you're, you know, bringing soil up over that root flare so that it's touching the trunk, you don't want to do that. You want to have the root the root flare exposed and just only basically having the roots themselves covered with soil. Okay. So then getting into um, watering. Um, this is another thing that I feel like I see being done wrong a lot. Um, and I think it's just, it's hard to know how much to water sometimes. And I get that. Um, and it's hard to know how much you're putting down. 
Um, essentially, you want to think uh, like as you're watering in things that uh, you're just planted in terms of putting down an inch, what will be equivalent to an inch of rain per week. Okay. Um, which is hard to gauge, I get that. But the intent being that you want to give your plants a deep and thorough watering, not a bunch of like really shallow, um, brief kind of waterings that are only just sort of like a little spritz of water that hits the surface. Um, you really want to encourage the roots of your plants to go deep into the soil and to reach down into that soil column so that when there are periods maybe of drought um, where the plant could easily be stressed, you want them to have those nice deep roots down in the soil where they can access some of that soil moisture that might still be down further in the soil. Um, if you're giving it lots of um, really shallow waterings, a lot of times what happens is the roots kind of stay right at the surface. And then if there's like a period of drought or sometime when you're you know, not able to keep up with watering, those roots are going to dry out really, really quickly, and they're going to the plant is going to suffer because of it. Um, so, especially when you first planted something, you want to um, water basically once or twice a week. Um, that's kind of a good way to know that you're giving. If you're watering, you don't want to water every day because then you're going to run the risk of overwatering. Um, but if you're forced to know that you're only going to water it once a week, you're going to hopefully water it very thoroughly that one time a week. Um, once a plant is established um, by the following season, basically, in theory, you really shouldn't have to water it at all and certainly not on a weekly basis. Um, at that point, the only time you might need to water your garden is um, if there are periods of drought or something like that where they're not getting kind of even any moisture from rain or something like that. Again, you want plants to be as well adapted to the soil that it's in, and you want it to be as well adapted to the environment that you're in. Um, and, and plants are tougher than you think, and tougher than I think even us as, as professionals uh, might give them credit for. And, you know, sometimes we just want to love our plants too much. You know, it's easy to, to over love our plants and we just want to give them water because they think that's what they need, but they're tough and they can handle it. But when you do water, you want to make sure you're doing a good job. Um, also keep in mind, I feel like I have, you know, where on there, like where to water. And you're probably like, duh, Sarah, like the soil, you would be amazed. The people that I see watering with their thumb over the end of the hose, and they're just like spraying the tops of their plants, like willy nilly. That's not really getting water down to the soil where the roots need it. The roots are where they're taking up the water. That's where you want to, you know, as best as you can try to, to direct um, your water and what you're putting down. Um, so focusing as best you can at the soil level. Um, if you can't stand out there with the hose because that takes a long time, set up a sprinkler. One of those like old school fan sprinklers are honestly a really great way to water your garden. Just turn it on and let it run for like two hours. And that's a really great way to give a nice uh, gentle soaking and a thorough soaking to your garden. And it's um, really nice because you don't have to stand there and do it yourself. All right. So as a horticulturist and as a professional gardener that you all now are, um, what are the tools that you're gonna wanna use to get yourself started? So these are just some of the tools that um, I really like to use. They're, this is by no means uh, an inclusive list. There are tons of things that I use um, depending on you know, different tasks that I'm doing, but these are kind of the ones that I wanted to highlight as my favorites or ones that I use like every day or like all the time. Um, I will note that because we're a government agency, I cannot tell you specific brands or make recommendations on specific brands. Um, so I'm so sorry, just you won't be able to ask or you can ask, but we can't tell you. Um, you know, one best suggestion I do have that as you're shopping for garden tools, um, maybe don't start at a big box store. Um, not that they don't have good tools there or not that they don't have good tools available. Um, I think you're going to get um, better quality things from maybe an independent garden center or from shopping like specifically from garden supply um, retailers that are online. Um, they're going to have better selection. They're going to have better quality products, uh, things that are going to last and are going to hold up and be durable for you. So for me, I always wear gloves every day for a multitude of reasons. I mean, quite frankly, working every day in the soil and getting my hands dirty, it just dries my hands out and really wrecks them. So certainly for me, I'm wearing gloves every day 
if you like working with your bare hands, that's totally your prerogative. Um, this is just something I like. I specifically like this kind um, because that I have on here because I have a, a nitrile coating on like the palms and the fingers. So it kind of adds an extra layer of protection um, from, you know, dirt or from rough branches, things like that from keeping my hands from getting scratched up. Um, this kind is also super nice because they are machine washable. Um, they do get gross and dirty and stinky. Throw them in the washing machine, come out good as new. Um, so, and they're nice because they're form fitting. So I don't lose my, my dexterity as I'm working. That's one of my complaints with a lot of garden gloves that are on the market um, is that you kind of sort of lose your mobility and lose your ability to do fine detail work when you have like big clunky garden gloves on. So those are ones that most of the horticulturists for Smithsonian Gardens wear or that style, I should say. Um, so I would look them up um, and give them a try. Um, my other two tools that I think I literally use every day, I literally every day, um, I get to work. The first thing I do is put my pruners and my soil knife, that holster right on my belt. Um, I think they are just, you know, the extension of a horticulturist hands are probably at least the pruners, if not the pruners and soil knife. Um, definitely with pruners, if you're willing to do it, spend the money to get a pair that's um, maybe a little bit better. Don't just go for the cheapest ones on the rack. They're going to break. They're not going to be sharp. You're going to have a hard time, um, you know, cutting things. Invest in a good pair of pruners. They will last a lifetime um, and you'll be grateful that you have them. Um, I also prefer using a soil knife over using a trowel, even when I'm planting. Um, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but the edge of this is actually serrated like a knife. Um, so it makes it really easy for um, digging holes, even when I'm planting. Um, and definitely if I'm doing weeding and that kind of thing, it's a really handy tool to have. Um, and then from there, my other favorite tool that I just love having is just a really nice plastic garden tote. Um, that style is great because they're flexible and they, you know, that size is kind of good because it holds enough to be worthwhile, but not so much that it gets heavy. I use it even just to carry water, to just put water on containers. Um, it's a just great universal kind of product to, to have at your side as you're going through your garden working in it. Um, some other tools here. One of the other tools that I use pretty frequently is a floral shovel. It's a little hard to tell from this picture, but the head of that shovel is actually about half the size of a regular shovel. Certainly have a regular shovel in your arsenal. You'll never, you're always gonna want a regular shovel. Um, but I really like the floral shovels. They're smaller, they're easier to maneuver. They're perfect for planting perennials, especially because they can get into nice um, small spaces in your garden because it's gonna be full of plants. I just know it. And when it's full of plants, you gotta have a small shovel so you can get in between the other ones to plant more. <laughs> Trust me, I know. Um, so that's a really, and it's nice and it's lightweight. I love that shovel. Um, in the middle is a scuffle hoe that I like. There's tons of different um, hoes and, and different tools for weeding. This is just one in particular that I like using. It's triangular shaped um, and it's actually sharp on all three sides of the triangle so that both as it's pushing through the soil forwards and as it's pulling backwards, it's um, cutting weeds off. Um, spring rakes, um, I definitely prefer these over um, like the big like plastic leaf rakes. Um, those, first of all, the tines break off of them like super easily. Um, these are just nice, partly because they're flexible. They're great for, of course, raking leaves. They're also great for if you're mulching or something like that, kind of spreading mulch out. Also great for if you are doing um, digging or planting to, or weeding to just lightly rake over the soil, you know, maybe rake up weeds or smooth soil out, something like that. I think those are, it's a kind of universal rake to have that's, that's helpful. Oh, sorry, skipped and okay. That brings me to the end. I know I rushed, probably feels like I rushed through a lot of that and hopefully you guys um, got a lot out from that. I hope you have some questions. I did wanna share, these are some resources. Certainly us as Smithsonian Gardens is a resource. Please feel free to reach out to us. I have our um, gardens email address on there. I have my own email address on there. Um, if you have questions about the presentation or you just need some clarification or more information, please don't hesitate to ask. You know, it's part of why we're here is to answer questions. We love talking about plants. We're big plant nerds, okay? We love it. 
we want to answer your questions. We want to talk to you. Certainly follow us on social media. We post lots of great information on there. Feel free to reach out to us, you know, hit us up on our DMs, as they say. Um, if you don't live near us, there's probably some sort of a local public garden or botanic garden near where you live. Those people also like talking about plants. They will also know the plants that are good for your region and good for your environment, and they can help you with maybe specific questions. Um, reach out to extension agencies. If you're kind of in the mid-Atlantic, we use the extension agencies from Penn State, University of Maryland, and Virginia Tech, um, but there should be extension agencies available in every state. All land grant universities have to offer extension services to their residents of their state, and they do it for free. Um, and they are a wealth of knowledge, and they have um, tons of people there that can um, help answer your questions um, and get you information that you need. And even um, going to local sort of independent garden centers, um, again, not big box stores. Um, those folks, unfortunately, are not quite as knowledgeable about gardening and horticulture. Um, but the folks at independent garden centers, you know, they're there because, they, again, they love gardening, they love horticulture, and, you know, they're going to know your area, they're going to know your region, and they're going to be able to help you decide um, what's best um, for your garden. Okay, I think I'm done. If you can breathe now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That's <laughs> terrific. And I've been typing answers to people as you've been talking, so uh, we don't have quite as many as what we would have, but there's still quite a few questions that I want to ask you and share okay. uh, sure. with the audience all at once. So one of them was, um, how do you get rid of bugs in the soil inside of the house? And then it was repeated because the one person knew that they had fungus gnats. So I answered that one with, you know, like you said, sometimes we over love our plants and we water them too much. And if we're putting a plant in a pot, we say, you know what, we're not going to put it in the pot size that it already was. We're going to put it in a much bigger pot so we won't have to water as much. What happens when we do that, Sarah? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, when that happens, uh, basically there's, there's too much soil there to hold water and the, there's not enough plant roots to sort of help use up that excess water. And so the water just like sits in the soil and when it sits in the soil, it becomes a really nice, cozy environment for things like fungal gnats. Or even if you have a plant that isn't an appropriately sized pot, if you're, watering it a lot or really often, or maybe you have a saucer and you're not draining water out of the saucer. Again, you're sort of creating this like wonderful moist environment that fungal gnats love to have. And um, they will, you know, start living there. <laughs> um, they will. They will. And it can also be a risk for drowning your plants. So yeah. that's an, another reason not to um, go kind of too big if you're transplanting especially for houseplants going from like a smaller pot and you want to put it into a bigger pot, mm -hmm. you don't want to go too big because you can also run the risk of, of drowning them for the same reason. The soil just holds too much water, more than the plant really needs. Um, and that can be the downfall of your plant, even if you think you're doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, we, we always, so I would just then suggest that the person either let the plant dry out a little bit. And I said, no deserts, no deserts. Right. Don't, don't say, oh, I'm never going to water again, right, but right. <laughs> bring down the watering. But what I found is works out the best. And, and maybe it's not fungus mats. Maybe it's another type of insect. In that mm -hmm. case, lift the plant, repot it you know, wash off the roots so that you can, before you repot it, and then watch the amount of watering. Cool conditions, which is most of our houses, well, at least especially this winter, are really wet soil, cool conditions. It's just a recipe for fungus gnats. But if they're pill bugs or something else that you brought in, get rid of them by replanting it, if you can, if you can. Or yeah. like my cats, they really like it when I bring in insects because they chase <laughs> them around the house and entertains them. <laughs> there um, you go. Yes. Okay. Get a cat. That's the answer. Get a cat. <laughs> take it. Um, <laughs> what are, let's say, for drip irrigation, how much time would be considered a deep watering? So I did the old tuna fish can uh, suggestion because it depends on how much water is being emitted first from your system. Okay. Two, so, what would be the other things? Um, well, I will say most ir like drip irrigation um, systems, it should say whether um, by the size of the tubing that you have or by the system program, it should 
somewhere indicate basically a gallons per minute. So mm-hmm. that's telling you how much water is being put out um, by the each of the emitters on the drip tube over the course of an hour. Um, we don't use a ton of really any drip irrigation um, in our gardens downtown. Um, one thing that is nice about drip irrigation is you can turn it on for a pretty long time. So when I've used it in the past, I would let it run for like two or three hours, um, once or twice a week, again, running for a longer amount of time, less frequently is better than running it, um, shorter amounts of time on like maybe an every day or every other day basis. Um, that's how, you know, you're going to get a much um, deeper and more thorough watering. Um, mm-hmm. and certainly you can, I'm no, I don't know the tuna fish can method, I've never heard <laughs> that, but I assume it's something where you like put a can under an emitter and see how much water And see, see how, how long it takes <laughs> to get an inch in the can. If you have a system right. like mine that I just bought on the cheap. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So the best thing to do is, is check with the manufacturer, you know, see what your specific tubing or your specific system is putting out. Um, and chances are, if you can look that up, they also may even have recommendations or if you reach out to them, they may have recommendations for saying, you know, if you run it for an hour or two hours, that's going to be equivalent of, you know, one or two inches of, of rain or water in your garden. Right. And you also should know your soil type because it yes. may be clay, it may be sandy. So right. uh, my old uh, suggestion too is just put your finger down in, see how far the system or the soil is wet engaged by mm-hmm. that because then you're going to know okay i watered for two hours the soil's going in down three four inches i'm good if the soil it is not wet at all or just the top of it you know that uh you better water a little bit more or maybe do some soil work to be able to add some compost or whatever um okay can you damage the plant leaves if you water in full sun this to me is a good question because it's a big myth. So go ahead. (laughs) Yes. Um, you, you, you can, it is, I'm not, not going to say that's not possible. Um, it's probably not the most ideal time to water, not necessarily because you can damage plant leaves, which you certainly can. Um, the water droplets can certainly sit on the leaf surface and basically act like a magnifying glass. And it's like the classic magnifier with an ant, you know, situation. Not that you should do that either. Don't do that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so it can create little, like little burn marks on your leaves. Um, it's also not the most ideal time of day to be watering anyway. And, and I didn't go into that on that side. Um, it's much better to really be watering either early morning or kind of in the evening once the heat of the day has passed. Um, a lot of times, um, or most of the time, plants sort of go into like a, I don't want to say dormant, but they slow down their processes and they're slowing down um, what they're doing during the heat of the day because it requires a lot of energy. Not unlike us as humans, most of the time when it's hot at like two o'clock in the afternoon, we're like, I'm going to go inside and take a nap and I'm going to do other things when it's not hot outside. Um, Plants kind of do the same thing. They sort of slow down what they're doing. They don't want to be expending a lot of energy when it's already hot and it's already sort of a stressful situation for them. Um, And so they're not even doing things like necessarily taking up water. Whereas if you're doing it in the morning or in the early evening, those are, it's, um, when plants are much more active, when they're more actively growing, they're taking up water through the roots and, and getting that water up into their plant cells. Yeah. Um, so I would definitely recommend if you can watering, you know, early morning before the sun gets intense or waiting until the evening when the sun is sort of starting to fade a little bit, the plants are going to appreciate the water during those times of day much more. And then you don't have any, um, you know, side effects basically of, of unintentionally burning leaves or something like that. Yeah. And I, I would add an environmental concern about that. If you water in the middle of the day, especially if you're doing overhead watering, it will mm-hmm. tend to evaporate. So you're yes. not you're using more water to be able to wet the soil than you would if it was in the morning. Also, if you're growing vegetables, I'd highly recommend not watering in the evening if those vegetables are things that get diseases. Because if the water sits on the leaves overnight, you might get a chance of getting uh, fungal diseases to go in it. Oh boy, they're just popping up like crazy. <laughs> um, so I have never heard of this test. So maybe you have. Would you differentiate herbaceous versus woody by saying if you can pinch a stem with your fingernails and it leaves a mark, it's herbaceous? Mm. I have never heard of that. Have you? I have not either. 
I don't know if I would say that because I can think of plenty of trees and shrubs where like if I put my fingernail into a leaf, it would probably leave an indent. Um, I'm not sure that that's a really great way of, of differentiating. Me. So how um, would you tell if it was herbaceous or uh, a woody plant? And, and I guess if you hadn't gone through a winter, because you know, if it dies down to the ground and you don't yeah. see anything, it's probably herbaceous. Right. I feel like that's probably a better rule of thumb. Like if it's something that dies back um, or dies down to the ground during the winter months, um, it's probably considered herbaceous. Um, certainly there are exceptions to that, like different perennials that I would also mm -hmm. consider herbaceous, but maybe don't necessarily die back to the ground. Um, I feel like, you know, I looked at the definition of what herbaceous was because I was trying to think of how to describe this. And literally the definition was like an herb. Yes. Like, that's Thank exactly. you, internet. That's not a helpful definition of herbaceous. <laughs> um, so, um, trying to define it, uh, I yeah, that's difficult. I feel like something that is has more of like a bark like surface on yes. the stems or on the primary trunk main stem of the plant is something that I would consider woody if it doesn't have um, a really tough bark like texture either on the main trunk or on stems of the plant then I would say it's herbaceous yes I, I, I would agree with you better way and, to describe it yeah and there is a, a category that is semi herbaceous or semi woody and you right. throw things like lavender and germander and um, rosemary in that category because they may look like they're totally going dormant and just dying down to the ground but mm -hmm. often they'll come back the next year it right. depends on where you live so mm -hmm. this one i i wasn't listening to you all the way because i was answering questions but i can't believe you said <laughs> this uh you said that after the first year of planting you shouldn't have to water plants at all i don't think you said that so I, <laughs> if i said it all i didn't yeah i definitely did not mean don't water at all um you should be able to and should think in terms of watering it significantly less. Like I said, there will be periods of drought. There will be times where that those plants will still need supplemental water. Um, the I, my point with that is more that you know you want these. You don't want to be out there every day, every week. You know, babying these plants along or trying to. Um, force them to live in conditions that aren't sort of naturally existing in the garden that you have. Um, so if you find that you're, I mean, and that's up to you, if you want to be out there every day and you want to be out there every week, watering your plants and babying them along, and you, you know, you're using plants that maybe require more water through the course of course of the year, then that's fine. You, you know, that's how you can, you can do that. I don't have time to do that <laughs> either yeah. in my garden at home um, or at work. Um, you know, so I do try to think of plants that are, or try to use plants that I know, you know, once I got them established in the first growing season, that for the most part, they're going to be okay with the rain that they're getting. And that maybe I only have to go out, you know, a couple of times during the summer, if we get a period with no rain, um, mm -hmm. to kind of help them along, you know, if it's, it is super dry. Um, but you know, you want these plants to be set up to live with the conditions that you have um, so that you're not out there constantly feeling like you have to baby them along. And that's kind of even goes along with loving them too much. If you right. feel like, you know, you shouldn't have to feel like you're out there watering all the time if you don't need to. Yeah, I agree. But watch your, your, watch your conditions because even plants mm -hmm. that are uh, mature and they've been in the ground for a while, if we have a really hard drought, um, especially evergreens, because uh, mm -hmm. you want to watch them in the wintertime. That's why I'm so glad we have uh, some snow this year. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes mm -hmm. the evergreens do dry out during uh, winter conditions and, and dry mm -hmm. soils. Now, to let everybody know, because we're getting close to the end, we will post this presentation on our Let's Talk Gardens video library, which you'll be able to find on our website. So we don't send these uh, website or these videos out to everybody, but you will be able to find it on our website. And you can watch it as many times as you want to and have a party at your house and let them come over and watch it too. <laughs> <laughs> or send it to people, send the link to people so they can watch it and get the graphics and such and see it all over again. So to let you know about that, that was one thing I really wanted 
to share with you. And then oh, there's so many other questions, but this one is a good one because of the plans that we do. I have an annual that has survived a few years. Was it mislabeled? Well, what is the true definition, a botanical definition of an annual compared to a tender perennial? So I would say a true definition, it, I will say probably was not mislabeled that might go mm -hmm. back to, you know, one of my first couple slides where I was talking about um, microclimates that you have um, in your garden specifically. Um, a true annual will die when temperatures get to extremes that it doesn't like. So for us, summer annuals don't like the cold, they don't survive. Um, things like the geraniums and petunias and whatever, you know, those things will look beautiful in the summer and then die in the winter. Conversely, we have things like the violas and ornamental cabbages and kales, which, you know, usually survive the winter. They don't always love the heat. And then they start to kind of fail during the heat of the summer. Um, there are also things like tender perennials. So that might be um, if you live right on the edge of a hardiness zone. Um, so you might be able to something that might be only hardy to, you know, a zone seven. Um, maybe if you're in between a six and a seven, you can get that plant to live in your garden. If you're right on the edge, um, maybe where you have it planted in your garden is just a warm spot. Maybe it's on the south facing side of your house. It's up against the house. You know, the roots are kind of staying warmer and it's more protected and sheltered because, you know, where it's situated. Um, we definitely have those at work. There's some um, annuals that we use that, you know, will come back for us. Uh, unless we have a really cold winter. Sometimes if you have a super cold winter, that plant that you thought was an annual and has come back a couple of years in a row, you have a cold winter and it's finally like, nope, I'm out. So without yeah. knowing your specific garden conditions and, you know, kind of where you live specifically, um, it probably wasn't mislabeled, but there's a lot of other factors that go into right. reasons why plants will live from year to year, even if you think it's only going to be one thing or another. Right. Because yeah. a true definition of, or a definition of botanically, a true annual is a plant that comes up, flowers, seeds, and dies all in one year. Now we can stretch it out because some People that make tags for plants is going to call uh, hibiscus, uh, a tropical hibiscus in annual. Because it, like you said, it's going to croak in the wintertime, for us anyway. Unless you plant it against a brick wall. And you never know. Get to know your plants. Read Botany for Gardeners. I can't tell you how good that book is. Because that will help you with all kinds of information and all kinds of definitions. But Sarah, it's been a delight as always. We ran over a little bit. I'm sorry to keep you extra. We'll have to pay you some other time. But thank you all for joining us again. And we hope to see you next week again on Let's Talk Gardens with Smithsonian Gardens. Everyone, hope you have a great day. Stay warm. Bye-bye.